Hello everyone. Welcome to this video series on natural language processing. In this series, we're going to go through the concepts of natural language processing, various algorithms involved in it, as well as look at the implementations. Let's begin with its history. The history of natural language processing really began after 1940s, which is after World War II. People recognized the importance of translation of one language to, to another and hope to create a machine that is capable of doing that sort of translations automatically. But by 1958, some researchers soon found out some issues with such translations. It was researchers like Chomsky who found it troubling that models of language recognized sentences that were nonsense but grammatically correct as equally irrelevant as sentences that were nonsense and grammatically incorrect. Let's see these two examples. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And the other sentence furiously sleep ideas green and colorless any speaker of english language can say that sentence one is grammatically correct and sentence two is grammatically incorrect and chomsky felt that the same should be expected of such models from 1957 to 1970 researchers split into two divisions of nlp and nlp the first one was symbolic approach while the second was was statistical approach symbolic approach was completely rule based and they focused on formal language and generating syntax while st while statistical approach are also called as stochastic approach was using statistical and probabilistic model in solving NLP problems. But after 1970, researchers split further embracing new areas of NLP. And this new area was logic-based paradigms that focused on encoding rules and language in mathematical logic, hence developing to the language called Prolog, which I guess every one of us has heard of. Many people get confused about the difference between natural language processing and natural language understanding. They are not the same. While NLP is a very broad concept, natural language understanding is a part of it along with natural language generation and these two components comprises to form a single component called NLP. Now while we talk about natural language understanding we deal with approaches like concepts, entities, keywords, emotion which can also be called as sentiment or relation and semantic roles. Solving any kind of NLP problems comprises of the following phases. The first phase is a phonological phase. I'll try to explain this in detail after this. The second one is morphological phase. Lexical phase. syntactic phase, semantic phase, discourse integration, and pragmatic analysis. Now what does each of these phases mean? Phonological phase is nothing but study of speech and sounds 
of a particular language and this is a very first component of NLP. If you're working with speech data, if you're working with any sort of data that includes speech, phonological phase is your first component in your approach to solve any kind of NLP problem. In phonological phase, we need to understand what phonetics is. I'll go very briefly about this one. Phonetics is nothing but the study of how speech sounds are made, speech sounds of human language from the perspective of the production perception or their physical properties when we talk about phonological awareness we include rhyme awareness word awareness phonemic awareness sentence awareness and syllabication well we won't go into into very detail of phonological analysis right now let's move on to our next step which is the morphological analysis Morphological analysis is nothing but study of word formation. We focus on identification and analysis of root word, affixes and POS which is part of speech tagging. Let's take an example here. Suppose we see a word washing this word is a combination of two different tokens which is was and ing this we called as our root word or our root token and this we called as our suffix if we see another word invaluable this is a combination of two word in plus valuable here in is our prefix while valuable is our root token so in morphological analysis we basically study how such words are formed we basically try to extract our root token and then try to understand how such words are formed from the root token what additional components are added into it whenever we talk about morphological morphological analysis we need to understand morphemes here so if we divide morphemes we can divide it into two parts one is stem while other is affix the root token that i'm referring it here is a stem and these uh, affixes which are basically prefix or suffix are combined with the stem and a single morpheme is formed even from here we can say that washing is a morpheme wash is our stem word and ing is our affix invaluable is our stem in is our affix and valuable is our stem word we'll see one more example consider the word re consideration here our consider is our stem word re is our prefix and asian is our suffix so to summarize morphological analysis what we do here is recognize root form of inflected word and construct a standardized representation of such word if we go a level further let's see this word book we can see this we can break this word as book plus singular if we say books this basically is book plus plural take an example of ran this can be written as ran run plus past tense we can even do uh, we'll see cats so cats is basically stem word is cat and this is a noun and this is a plural form of that noun if we see a word geese it's a goose it's a noun and it's a plural form of that noun we'll see one more 
finally missed so this is miss plus verb plus past tense so in case of morphological anal analysis we break our morpheme into into its, its its stem its affix and not only that we also define the grammatical structure of that morpheme we go to the third step which is the lexical analysis so in case of lexical analysis what we do is we try to understand what the word means we also try to understand its context and and we finally make note of the relationship of one word to the other let's take an example i am going to colorado so here i is my pronoun m is my verb going is also a verb to is a preposition colorado is a noun and this dot is my delimiter whenever we're talking about lexical lexical form we basically need to understand the difference between lexemes and tokens so from the above example what we can make out is all of these single single words that i have these are lexemes and the corresponding grammatical representation of these words or lexemes that i have are called tokens so i is a pronoun as i wrote m is a verb verb preposition noun and a delimiter now we move on to our third step which is our syntactic analysis what we do in syntactic analysis is we check syntactic structure of a sentence or of a collection of collection of lexemes and its components and we basically generate a parse tree you must have heard about context free grammar so what we do in context free grammar is if we have a sentence let's say the gall bladder is surgically absent what we can do in syntactic analysis is we can represent this word in terms of its component and generate a parse tree here now we move on to another phase which is called the semantic analysis in semantic analysis we try to understand the context we try to understand the emotions that might be depicted in our sentence we try to extract information from our text and semantic analysis is commonly used in applications like translation chatbot and search engines whenever we talk about semantic analysis procedure the first step is basically entity linking and entity categorization which works in combination with entity search and topic extraction we'll go to these individual topics in detail in upcoming videos we can divide semantic analysis into two different types the first one is lexical semantic analysis Lexical semantic analysis involves understanding the meaning of each word of text individually and it basically refers to fetching the dictionary meaning that a word in the text is 
deputed to carry the other one is compositional semantic analysis in compositional semantic analysis we try to understand the combination of individual words from the meaning of text we try to understand this using this sentence if i say i love messi and messi loves me these two sentences mean completely different things such such type of information extraction or information understanding or cons or context understanding is done in uh, semantic analysis part now when we talk about tasks involved in semantic analysis we basically use semantic analysis for word sense disambiguation let's write tasks here so word sense disambiguation in word sense disambiguation we try to understanding the meaning of word the meaning of word may vary as per its uses in sentences and the context of the text so basically word sense disambiguation involves interpreting the meaning of a word based on the context of its occurrence in a text let's say a word called bark these actually mean two different thing one is dog's bark and the other is bark of a tree so to understand the true meaning of the word bark it's impossible to say just looking at the word but if we go towards the context of it or the use of it in the sentences we can understand and extract its true meaning another such word is bank let's say bank mean two different thing one is a financial institution the other is a uh, river bank let's say so to understand the meaning of the word bank if you only look at the word we cannot catch its true meaning but if we go towards the context of it or the uses of it then we can achieve its true meaning so word sense disambiguation is basically the ability of a machine to overcome the ambiguity involved in the meaning of a word based on its uses and context remember the term ambiguity here ambiguity means nothing but confusion basically the word bark is ambiguous in terms of its meaning because it gives two different meanings until and unless we see the context of it we cannot simply say that the word bark means something similarly uh, the case is the same with the word bank another task that we do in semantic analysis is relationship extraction so relationship extraction involves identifying various entities present in the sentence and then extracting the relationship between those sentences basically we try to understand the relation between words in a sentence or even the relation between different sentences we will also look at some elements of semantic system now when we talk about the elements of semantic system the first one is hyponymy now what hyponymy means is hyponymy refers to a term that is an instance of a generic term it can also be understood by taking a class object as an analogy for example if we say color color is a hyponymy color is a hyponymy while gray blue green are its hyponyms so this is how we understand hyponymy let's go towards its second component uh the second component is homonymy so homonymy can be understood as two or more lexical terms with the same spellings but completely 
different in meaning let's take an example of bank again these two again the word bank gives two different meanings one is a river bank and one could be a financial institution or or a bank so so the word bank is a homonymy that gives that has the same spelling but gives completely two different meanings another component that i would like to discuss here is synonymy it's a very common word synonym uh, so i think you understand it pretty well well synonymy is two or more lexical terms that might be spelled differently but has the same or similar meaning let's say a word large large is a synonymy for a word big or let's say huge these all are synonyms and 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 these words are said to be or like these words are said to go and these words are called synonyms the another component is antonymy again it's the same as antonyms if i say hot its antonym is cold so these are the type of components that we need to understand especially in semantic analysis the last one or the second last one i want to talk about is polysemy now what polysemy means is polysemy refers to a lexical term that have same spelling but multiple closely related meanings well it actually differs from homonymy because the meaning of the terms need not be closely related in case of homonymy let's say a man a man may mean a human species or a male human or like an adult male so a single word man can have three different meanings but these meanings are kind of closely related to each other hence the word man is a polysemy now another component i'd like to discuss is a meronymy now meronymy can be understood as a relationship wherein one lexical term is a constituent of some larger entity so if we say a word will so will is basically a meronym of automobile if i say teachers so this could be a meronym for a school or university so this is how we understand meronymy so to summarize there are uh, these these type of elements that we need to consider in a semantic system hyponymy homonymy synonymy autonomy and autonomy polysemy and meronymy now semantic analysis again means giving exact meaning of the text the role of semantic analyzer is to check text for meaningfulness one last thing i'd like to link link out here is uh, basic building blocks of a semantic system again we'll come to semantic analysis uh, later on but this is just kind of an introduction for it the first one is entities entities basically refers to uh, like entities basically represents individuals example person or location or maybe organization or something the other is concept uh, concept represents uh, a general category of individuals like person vehicle animals and things like that the other is relation uh, relation uh, basically represents a relationship between entities and concepts like uh if we say uh and a lion maybe an animal so like what we can say is lion is an animal the other is predicate uh 
so basically our our predicate represents our verb structure example case grammar or semantic rules and things like that and then the last is case grammar now the case grammar is a form of grammar in which structure of sentence is analyzed so structure of sentence analysis okay so this is all i wanted to talk about in semantic uh, analysis for now the another important phase in nlp is discourse integration i'd like to give you a very brief introduction about this so so what happens here is we try to make a sense of context example let's say okay so bill had a red balloon okay this is too thin let me make this a little bit thicker and let's say john wanted it so there are this pronoun it here and we actually have to understand what this it means so if we if we from a human perspective read these two sentences we can easily figure out that it means balloon here but this is needed to be understood by our system or by the computer itself so how do we do this the process is called discourse integration so it basically deals with how the immediately preceding sentence can affect the interpretation of our text uh, this is actually closely related to pragmatics uh, it gives the meaning of any sentence uh, in case of discourse integration meaning of any sentence depend upon the meaning of sentences before it in addition it also brings about the meaning of immediately succeeding sentence uh, it deals with how the immediately preceding sentence can affect the interpretation of the upcoming sentence <clears throat> so it's basically study of text and context of our language it, uh, we deal with understanding our text and uh, we also deal with connecting the semantic representation of different sentences in case of discourse integration now the now the last step that i have uh, in the phases of NLP is uh, pragmatic analysis so when we talk about pragmatic analysis pragmatic analysis uh, is a kind of study of language that is not actually spoken but it's but instead is it's only hinted so we'll take an example turn on the heat it's getting cold so if we see this sentence what does this sentence mean does this sentence mean that we want to turn on the heat itself turn on the heat or or maybe turn on the heat somehow or like we want to say turn on the heater i think it's this one so the so the speaker basically wants the other person to turn on the heater here well it's not actually uh, said here it's only said turn on the heat and not turn on the heater but the meaning is kind of implied so that what we deal with pragmatic analysis here in this case there are different aspects of pragmatic analysis the first aspect is dixis now what do they mean they mean that words are phrase that cannot be fully understood without uh, additional information suppose if i say meet me here just this sentence meet me here what do i mean by the word here where do i want the other person to meet me until and unless i give i give a specific location uh, the other person cannot understand this so 
So the kind of scenario that we have here is called Dixis. Uh, the other one is Implicator. In case of Implicator, it could be a conversational Implicator. Let's see an example of a conversational Implicator. So suppose agent one says I am hungry and agent two says there is a cafe nearby. So whenever the first agent is, is saying that he is hungry, it's not, it's not compulsorily uh, it's not a compulsory situation for agent two to understand that he is asking, asking for a nearby, nearby food location. But it's kind of implied here. Whenever agent one says I'm hungry, agent two understands that he wants a location, a like he wants, he wants food at that instant of time, and then he suggests that there is a cafe nearby. So this uh, kind of implicator uh, is called a conversational implicator. Now, there is another aspect uh, of pragmatic analysis, which is presupposition. If I say uh, John's brother is buying two iPhone 14, whenever one person reads this sentence, it he definitely supposes that John's brother is actually a rich man or like who has money. Hence, he's buying two iPhone 14s, which is actually kind of very expensive these days, right? So, so yeah, it's kind of a presupposition from the presupposition made from the given sentence. One last aspect is speech text. Now, what happens is in speech text is uh, a kind of action is represented in a sentence. When I say I smashed the potato, I don't mean that I literally smashed the potato, but maybe uh, I mashed them or like I boiled them and then uh, crushed them, crushed them and things like that. So, so yeah, the sentence itself uh, gives us a clear indication of some kind of action done on our object here. So this aspect is called speech text. So this is all I have for the uh, regarding the seven phases of our NLP. Now one important part that I would like to talk about in this video and one last part that I'd like to talk about in this video is the term ambiguity. Natural language processing is indeed a difficult task because of this particular concept, which is ambiguity. Again, if I talk about ambiguity, ambiguity means nothing, but if, if you want to understand it in a simple manner, it just means confusion. Let's go with it phase by phase. Let's see it in morphological phase. If we go to a uh, morphological phase, we see that there is kind of a confusion here with the word book. So the word book can be a word book plus noun plus singular or the word book can be book plus verb. Now, which one is the correct one or like which one, which one do I actually mean? You cannot just say it by looking at a word. You indeed need to look at the complete complete sentence that is uh, where this word is used and hence and hence after that only you can uh, say that okay uh, the book the word book refers to a noun or the word word book refers to a, a verb in another phase let's talk about syntactic phase syntactic phase actually denotes ambiguity in grammar structure let's see a word Visiting relatives can cause problems. 
if I if I analyze this sentence, I can get two meaning from this sentence. One, relative who visit can cause problems. Or the other, when we visit relatives, there can be problems. Now again, which one is the correct one? Well, you cannot just say by looking at this sentence because it gives two different meanings here. So uh, when we see this in the complete complete context, maybe we can figure out something here. The other phase that I'd like to talk about is uh, semantic ambiguity or ambiguity in semantic phase. If I say uh, a sentence Conchon is in a bad state. What do I mean with the mean by the word state? This could be termed as bad condition, or this could be termed as some state in some country. So, which one is the correct one? Again, I cannot uh, say it just by looking at this sentence because this clearly gives me two different two different meaning if i want to know the know the proper meaning of this i need to see its context where this sentence is being used the other one is discourse ambiguity now what happens is discourse ambiguity is basically i'll say uh, one sentence monkey eats banana when they wake up so who are the word they here do they mean monkey or do they mean banana because both are nouns and both can be implied here so the correct answer for this case is monkey let's see another similar sentence here monkey eats banana when they are ripe now in this two sentence only this action changes here but whenever this action is changed uh, the referral uh, that the pronoun they is making also actually changes now who is the term they referring to here is it referring to monkey or is it referring to banana obviously in this case it's referring to banana but yeah there can be multiple uh, multiple meaning even with the slightest change in words so this is what we call discourse ambiguity finally i'd like to talk about some challenges in nlp so if i talk about challenges these are the following challenges that we currently face in NLP. It's elongated words. Sometimes, especially when we chat, uh, we might write thank you so much. What does this word so mean? Basically, it's an elongated form of the word so, but it's very difficult for a computer to understand this very uh, understand this so so it can cause a lot of problem the another is shortcut someone um, might write come here ASAP now wh what is ASAP we as humans uh, understand this because we keep using this this basically as soon as possible but it's very difficult for a computer to figure out what this word ASAP means the another is handling emojis so we tend to use a lot of emojis especially in our conversations here now when when such uh, conversation data is extracted and then and then used as a data set for some kind of some kind of nlp task it's very difficult to handle emojis uh, emojis here which makes it very complicated uh, in 
in our NLP application. The other is mixed use of language. Again, we have a tend to uh, tend to add add or like join two different languages uh, whenever uh, we are typing, whenever we are chatting with our friends. So it creates a lot of confusion because uh, the multiple language, uh, the combination of the combination of a multiple language clearly uh, clearly clearly degrades our data data form and then it's very hard to separate uh, separate it out during the data cleaning process the other is ellipsis i'll give one example with ellipsis let's say a sentence peter worked hard and passed the exam and Kevin too. Okay, so from this one, one single sentence, we can make multiple interpretation here. The first interpretation is Kevin worked hard. The second implication is Kevin passed the exam. And then the third implication is uh, Kevin worked hard and he also passed the exam. So this is kind of a difficult task for a machine to understand uh, such multiple interpretations here. The other is uh, punctuation ambiguity. For this, I have a very simple example. Just two sentences where punctuations are used at different places. So let me write those sentences. The first sentence is women, woman without a man, comma, is nothing. And the second is women without okay i'll say this her okay so her man is nothing okay so if we look at the first sentence it clearly means that women is nothing without her man but when you look at the second sentence women if she's absent man is a nothing so these two sentences gives you gives you different meanings just with the change in the places in punctuations here so this is uh, a kind of ambiguity that we have to deal with which is a punctuation ambiguity and which is also a challenging task especially in natural language processing so uh, what what programming languages do we use whenever we are we are working with natural language processing so the famous language or the or the widely used language is python not only that especially uh, for data analysis we also use r and also nlp can be done using java because uh, some of the libraries uh, like uh, stanford ner uh, and such libraries base classes are all written in java even though they can be used in python too but yeah, these are the three main languages that uh, are used as a programming language for NLP. Uh, now, finally, uh, to conclude this video, I'd like to talk about the applications. Well, there are a lot of applications of NLP. Uh, to name some of them, they are sentiment analysis, text classification, chatbots, virtual assistants, text extraction, machine translation, text summarization, market intelligence. Uh, autocorrect suggestion, intent classification, and speech recognition. So this is all for this first video. In the next video, we're going to talk about morphological analysis and its detail. Thank you for watching. If you have any, if you have any questions or confusion, please comment down below and I'll try to answer them. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Bye -bye.